So I think I've also talked a lot about relationships and forming strategic, supportive relationships early in your working relationships with professionals is, is really important. Figuring out who your allies can be. And this is an important point. You don't actually have to, you know, not everyone has to be your best friend. As a parent of a child with special needs, sometimes you will find that it's a, it's a kind of a lonely path that other people don't really get your concerns. You know, their, their trauma may be whether or not they're going to get their kid into the special ballet program or French immersion, and you're hoping that one day your child will be able to say, Mom. So you don't really need to like them or want to socialize with them. And in fact, I would, you know, keep the socialization probably is not, not what, you know, keep it a professional but pleasant relationship. Um, Try not, to get, try not to be personally angry with them. Try and restrain yourself from putting these in personnel, you know, making it very personal. Um, it kind of interferes with your ability to um, work effectively. One of the things I often think about, too, is saying to families that most of us, until we have a child with special needs, have done a pretty good job of getting along with people. And everything, you know, like, things aren't too hard. You know, like... Not always great, but most of the time, life rubs along. Suddenly, you're advocating for someone who can't speak for themselves. Most people don't understand them. And you are living quite a stressful life at home because the needs are not being met. And that's a generalization. But based on the thousands of families I've worked with, it's not, uh, it's not an unusual circumstance. So suddenly, you're trying to find a way forward. and. You know, you may be a person who finds any kind of conflict really difficult. You know, so actually challenging anyone is something that you ordinarily wouldn't do. Avoidance is your way of getting through life. Suddenly, you have to step up and engage and be firm on behalf of your child. Maybe you come from a culture where that kind of engagement is frowned upon, particularly, um, you know, that it's, it's much better just not to do so. In Canada, it's necessary, and I think it's required. And bottom line, people don't need to like you, right? They don't need to like you. They just need to respect you. And so you're doing everything you can. You know, you've learned a lot. You have information to share. You're working hard with your child at home. You're not expecting the school to do everything. You're working very hard at home. You're working with the therapist at home. And you're not asking that this is a popularity contest, but you're just asking that they respect you as you respect them, and they don't have to like you. So that's kind of like my little mantra at one point, because I was rather used to having people like me, and suddenly they didn't much anymore. And I had to get over that. And I think um, if you make, you know, if you're the person who's asking, who's, who's challenging the accepted way of doing things, if people say to you, well, this is our policy, and you say to them, is that policy in writing? Could you share it with me? Suddenly, you know, you're being a bit challenging, and that's difficult. Right? So, um, you know, it's, it's really, you're doing this for your kids, and that's the only reason you're having any dealings with them in the first place. So, sustaining relationships. You want to model the behavior for the people who work with your child and the home team. You want to model the behavior you want to draw out of each team member. So you want to be um, mindful of the demands on their time. One young um, behavior consultant told me recently that she had gone to the parents' house at 6 or 6.30 in the morning thinking that she was going to do a um, bedtime routine, help the child get up in the morning, you know, to get the bedtime routines on an even balance and discovered that she was actually there because the parent wanted to have a meeting uh, so that she could go off to her yoga class early. This is not a way to develop warm and friendly relations with your team, right? Because people will make a special effort for you if they understand what it is that you need, and everyone understands the need to sleep. But you have to be respectful of um, the time of the professionals who work with your child. And I think this is worth thinking about because I've noticed that Parents who have children with special needs are so acutely focused on their child's interests and needs 
that sometimes they lose perspective about the rest of the world and how they have to relate to other people and that they have to be respectful of the fact that you know, they don't function well at 6.30 in the morning or um, they can't expect to be able to call uh, team members late at night on the weekend and expect an immediate response. Right? You know, so that's being respectful of the professionals around you. Just as you should expect them, if they say that they're going to be there at 3 o'clock for a meeting, that they're there at 3 o'clock, right? Um, so be patient. Um, provide them with helpful, relevant information. So those profiles, um, background information on the kind of therapy that you're doing with your child. Um, be as educated as you can. So very soon, you're, you're able to be much more of a support to the professionals on your team. Um, do as much as you can. In terms, in terms of you know, saving autism funding, I often, when I was um, involved, I would, I would develop a lot of the, you know, for actually the site of Velcro and, and uh, is still adversive to me. Because I spent so many years making those little vel, you know, those little kind of icons from Boardmaker and putting, this is prior to, being able to do this on an iPad, okay? You're, you're, I'm your historic institutional memory here. So I would make thousands, and of course they always were getting lost. So I used to make binders made of Velcro and then you know, sticking these things on. And I remember a few, you know, probably Adam's second, maybe grade 11, and by this time he was reading fluently and you could make lists for him writing, then he would just tick, and tick them off. And a young, um, speech, uh, a young uh, special education assistant came to me and said, you know, such a great idea. I'm going to do a visual schedule for Adam and I've got all these icons. And, you know, it was like, no, no, we are not doing that again. <laughs> we've been there, we've done that. But, you know, it's, it's when he was younger, I saved us a lot of money by doing all of that stuff myself, right? And it didn't take... You know, you didn't have to have a degree in computer science to be able to print them out, cut them up, you know, and, and do the rest of it. So the things that you can do to be helpful to the program is really great. You'll save money. Um, you'll be seen as someone who doesn't just judge, but actually engages. And especially if you can come and educate yourself and bring things back, that, that's also very helpful. One of the questions you can... Um, ask yourself is, am I asking of this professional something that I wouldn't really want to do myself, right? Um, say, you know, be, say thank you a lot. And, and I think that, that we, uh, the power of thank you is, is pretty profound. And I think a lot of our families are extremely um, um, grateful for the work that professionals do for their children. And you know, uh, you know, the manager's rule, wherever possible, reward publicly. So when you say thank you to people in front of other people, that kind of ups a notch. When you criticize them in front of other people, that also makes it that's really serious. So criticize, if you have criticisms that you need, do it privately, if you can. And this is finding support. So this is kind of related to that whole IEP thing, is, um, this is, this is great. We have two, two great books of cartoons at the ACT office. You're always welcome to come in and see, and we can send you the website too. And this is all about finding support. And so here's the circle of, you know, it's an IEP meeting, or it could be any kind of meeting. And here is the parent on the left and their advocate to the right. And the... Uh, statement is, I'm not sure why Mr. Barth always feels compelled to bring an advocate to an IEP meeting. And of course it's because, you know, we feel all alone. So um, yes, we do feel outnumbered sometimes, so finding support is really, really important. And that's one of the reasons earlier today I was introducing people to, you know, depending on what community you live in, because um, finding friends Often our families find that they don't have a lot to talk about to parents who have neurotypical children because their interests and concerns are so different. Um, so we can get a lot of support from each other. 
And if you live in a community and you're looking for someone in your community, sometimes we can say to you, maybe you want to give so-and-so a call. She's very nice or she has a child the same age as you. Doesn't mean you're necessarily going to have anything in common or like each other or want to talk to each other ever again. But sometimes, it, sometimes you have really meaningful friendships. Um, and I have friendships that go back 20 years that started you know, in a parent's group. So projecting an image. Um, when you go to a meeting, dress professionally. It's not the time for hot pants, and I make that as an extreme, you know, but really, you know, all the sort of, um, you know, sweatpants, hot pants, whatever it is, whatever's the fashion now. It's the time, you don't, you want everything to be focused on what you're going to say. So try and dress as professionally as you can. Arrive on time. This is really important because you've got so little time with professionals to discuss these issues that if you arrive late, it could be traffic, it could be anything, you're, you know, you're not going to get that time back. So you know, arrange to be there 15 minutes early so they have no excuse for starting the meeting late, meeting late and then you don't get to discuss what it is that's really important for you. So you have someone with you to take notes and to debrief. You're thinking strategically about where you're going to sit so you can see everybody. That's good, right? You're going to smile appropriately and project confidence, right? This is important. You're not, you're, you're there, you have a role. You're Sammy's mom, right? And so it's not, it's not about you and your personality. You're there representing your child. You should introduce yourself and the person who's with you. And it's a good idea in advance to let the school know that you're bringing someone with you, just so that they know who's coming. And you can ask, if you, you know, sometimes it's very helpful to, to send around a piece of paper and say, I'd really like to know who's here. Because if you think about that meeting with a crowd of 1,000, it could be only four or five people. It could be just two. But if you have their names, it's good. And an email address so you can follow up if you have any concerns or questions later. Um, Bring that binder with you that where you've kind of organized yourself and you show how organized you are. Um, you have that photo of your child front and center. So managing your choice of words, temperament, and body language. Don't let emotion and fear erode your behavior. Uh, remember how you say something might be as important as what you say. Um, be firm but calm. Now, I say all this, and I have to tell you, I've cried through a few IEP meetings myself. So there's no, I don't, and I'm not ashamed of that. I struggled not to, but sometimes our emotions do get the best of us. Um, so make a plan. What could you do if you feel you might lose control? Um, you know, are you going to say, I'm sorry, I can't go on with the meeting today. Could we reschedule? Um, now be aware of the emotions of others. If, you're, you know, if people are sitting there and looking at you like this, it's not a good sign. Yeah. Um, effective listening, you know, you face the speaker. This is something our kids teach us how important it is to look at somebody when they're talking to you, right? If you've had teenagers who are neurotypical, you know how it drives you crazy if people don't look at you when they're talking it, right? It's very impolite. Um, and you yourself probably don't have autism because if you have autism, it might be difficult to look at the person who's speaking. But if you don't have that diagnosis, you should make your best effort. You should try not to have a sneer on your face if someone says something that you disagree with, try not to make it too obvious. Um, listen to what their ideas are. Um, don't interrupt. Wait for a pause to ask questions. Ask your questions. Be attentive. Um, give feedback. And pay attention to what is not being said. So a lot of, a lot of um, communication is actually body language. So you can show respect for the speaker by the, way you, by the way you look at them, by the fact you're listening, you're nodding, whatever. Um, it's actually very little communication is actually in the words. Jargon and acronyms. Um, often when you're going to a meeting, they'll use lots of initials, right? They're in a school. They have lots of initials for everything. So you can say, sorry, I don't know what that means. Can you, give, can you just tell me? Ask. Don't let it go past. Um, and we also have a list of acronyms which we need to update because they do change. Assertiveness is expressing your needs clearly, 
as expressing ideas without guilt or, term, or intimidation. You stick up for your child's needs, even when professionals disagree. You treat professionals like partners, because they are partners in the interest of your child. You convey your feelings of self-confidence through the way you communicate. You, you know, focus on advocating effectively. You thinking about self-reliance and independence. And assertiveness is not beating around the bush, feeling too guilty or afraid to express yourself, agreeing with the professionals no matter what you really think. So none of just sort of nodding, you know, and everyone leaves and you feel terrible. You have to speak up. If you're not feeling confident about the plan, you need to speak up. You're not a junior partner. You don't need to apologize for what your child requires. And you don't need to beg for what they need. Um, and you don't surrender the right to advocate for your child to other people. Right? It is your right and it is your responsibility.